A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. So glad that you joined us on the uh, program today. We have a lot, a lot to uh, talk about, including some news from the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, you know, we are watching and we have been watching uh, for a couple of months now anyway, the uh, Supreme Court uh, and a, a case called New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Courtlet. Now, this is a case that challenges New York State's gun licensing laws in terms of carrying a firearm for self-defense, not in terms of acquiring a firearm. This is about the right to bear arms, not about the right to keep arms. And uh, on Monday, February 22nd, the state of New York uh, is due to file its response in this case. We have already seen a number of amicus briefs filed with the court uh, on uh, behalf of attorneys generals around the country, uh, on behalf of gun owners around the country, on behalf of uh, 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 you know gun owners in New York State, urging the Supreme Court to hear this case. Now the state of New York is going to uh, tell the Supreme Court why it should not accept this challenge to the uh, state's carry laws. Uh, that brief again due today at the Supreme Court. Uh, and then the next step for the court will be to schedule this case in conference. That's where the justices all get together uh, and decide, are we going to hear this case or not? It takes four justices to agree to hear a case. It takes, of course, five to win a case once it has been heard. And the expectations, I think, are um, pretty high right now that this is a case that the Supreme Court uh, could take. Now that Justice Amy Coney Barrett is on the bench, on paper anyway, uh, we should have at least five justices who are willing to uh, hear this case, maybe six if Chief Justice John Roberts were to go along. Uh, the big challenge is going to be that there have been similar efforts to uh, litigate New York State's carry laws. Uh, those uh, cases have not come to fruition. So basically the state's argument is, look, the, the courts had a chance to consider this. The court has refused to consider these cases. They refused to uh, hear a challenge before. Uh, and therefore, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals a decision regarding carry licenses uh, and the process by which they are issued in New York State, uh, which, by the way, the Second Court says, oh, fine, they're fine. No, no Second Amendment problem whatsoever. Uh, New York's position is going to be, look, the, the, the lower courts have already ruled. There's no reason for you, the Supreme Court, uh, to take up this issue. I disagree. Uh, as do the uh, amici who have filed, uh, uh, you know, briefs uh, urging the court to take this case, arguing uh, biggest argument is that, look, there's a split uh, in the appellate circuit courts as to what is constitutional, and what is not constitutional when it comes to the issuance of carry licenses. Uh, you've got some jurisdictions that say you can make it as restrictive as possible. Because there is no right to carry a concealed firearm. That would be the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Then you have the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals that say, uh, no, that, that's not right. Because if the average citizen can't obtain a license to carry, well, then the right to bear arms in self-defense is being denied to those folks. Uh, and unless the average resident can obtain a license to carry, then you're turning a right into a privilege. Again, we will have to wait and see what the court does with this case, but a, another big development in NYSRPA versus Courtlet. Meanwhile, we've got uh, more gun control legislation coming down the road at the uh, state level. There's a uh, headline out of my home state of Virginia, ban on guns in Capitol Square continues to advance in the General Assembly. This is a big wish list item for gun control advocates at the state level. We're also looking at a potential vote in Washington State Senate today on a ban on open carrying uh, at the state capitol. Uh, this really started last year when the COVID lockdown measures first came into effect and you had a number of protests at uh, state capitals, uh, most notably in Michigan, where a uh, number of individuals brought their guns inside the capitol, as is allowed by law, uh, but lawmakers proclaimed that they felt unsafe, they felt afraid, uh, uh, they felt afraid. And since then, in Michigan... Uh, there have been efforts to ban firearms from the Capitol outright. At the moment, the uh, current uh, rules are that the open carrying of firearms is banned inside the Capitol, but those with concealed carry licenses can still do so. 
uh, which to me should satisfy those objections from lawmakers who said they felt intimidated by the sight of uh, armed gun owners while still allowing folks to exercise their right of self-defense. Uh, because, of course, that gun ban doesn't just apply to uh, protesters who might be carrying a firearm and a, a political statement, but it applies as well to employees who work at the state capitol who would then be disarmed going to and from their vehicle uh, in a city that is not necessarily the safest in the country. Uh, Lansing's violent crime is not as bad as Detroit, but it's not Mayberry. Uh, and it's certainly reasonable to me that uh, uh, individuals who work at the Capitol maybe getting out of work late at night uh, would not only want to, but would be able to exercise their right to bear arms on their way to and from work, as well as while they're at the uh, Capitol as well. Uh, these types of uh, attempted gun bans, these sort of mini gun bans, these are not... Again, uh, sweeping bans on handguns or even bans on so-called uh, assault weapons. Um, this is more of a time, manner, and place restriction, which, legally speaking, may make the uh, the courts more amenable to accepting uh, these restrictions. But I have to tell you, I, I think that there is still a, uh, a very viable legal challenge to be made uh, to any and all of these gun bans that might get signed into law, uh, banning the open carry of firearms, generally speaking, or banning uh, firearms from uh, you know locations like the state capitol or in Virginia, outside of the state capitol, uh, in a portion of downtown Richmond called Capitol Square. Uh, and in Virginia, there are lawmakers who are speaking out against this proposal. Uh, Delegate Glenn Davis, Republican from Virginia Beach, said, I find it concerning that we are literally passing a bill because we're afraid, or some people happen to be afraid, of the Virginia Citizens Defense League Lobby Day. Uh, they question whether or not Democrats were legislating against a single group. But Democrats on the House Public Safety Committee, according to WDBJ, said the presidents of armed demonstrators left many fearing for their safety. They'll get Candy King from Prince William County in Northern Virginia said, quote, this is not just about us. It's also about the people this space belongs to. And they should be able to come here without fear of weapons. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Because first of all, a gun-free zone does not and should not. If you are, if, listen, let, let me back up a second. If you are afraid that somebody might be carrying a gun to do you or others or, or, or anyone else harm, why would you feel better about a gun-free zone? Because they don't work to actually prevent anybody with evil intent from bringing a gun into that location and then using it against others. A gun-free zone is a sign. It may even be a misdemeanor charge for those violating uh, a, uh, a provision that bars firearms from a certain location. But again, if somebody has ill intent and wants to actually murder people in a gun-free zone, they're not going to be dissuaded by the fact that they're not allowed to bring a gun there. Uh, Patrick Hope, Democrat from Arlington, another uh, Democrat, said, uh, quote, you can't carry, carry guns in a courthouse. You can't carry guns on airplanes. You can't carry guns in the U.S. Capitol. And starting in July, it's going to be the law that you can't carry, carry guns on Capitol Square. So he seems pretty positive. And I got to say, I, I think the fix is probably in here. With Democrats in control of both chambers of the legislature and the governor's mansion in Virginia, their gun ban is probably going to be signed into law by Governor Ralph Northam uh, and will likely take effect in July. And then will likely be subject to a lawsuit because the details of this bill are still being worked out. But right now, not only would this apply to the Capitol building itself, the grounds of the state Capitol in Virginia, but public streets and buildings around the state capitol as well. Now, it may be, again, that a, they could get a judge to go along with a ban on firearms inside the state capitol. I think that'd be the wrong thing to do. They may very well even get a judge to go along with a ban on uh, firearms on the capitol grounds. Although, again, I think that would be the wrong thing to do. But when they start getting into defining this gun-free zone to include public streets, to include public sidewalks, to include buildings, parking garages, uh, surrounding the state capitol, that's where I think uh, these lawmakers are going to find themselves um, with a, uh, a real legal challenge on their hands. Now, again, I think a much better solution would, instead of a, a gun ban for lawful gun owners, 
Uh, I think a, frankly, I don't even think there's a solution that's needed here. I think this is a solution in search of a problem. You know, as the uh, Republican delegates mentioned, Lobby Day in the state of Virginia, uh, in which the Virginia Citizens Defense League has uh, rallied usually hundreds, but over the last couple of years, it's been thousands of gun owners for the state capital in Richmond. There's not been an incident. There has not been a single incident of violence. In fact, there haven't even been arrests. The one arrest that was made in 2020, when you had somewhere between 30 and 50,000 gun owners in downtown Richmond, the one arrest that was made was for a woman who was wearing a mask. Believe it or not, that was that was the charge. Going about while wearing a mask. Now, of course, that was about two months before we were all told we have to wear masks. And ultimately, those charges were dropped. But that was the only incident. So this isn't about responding to the uh, storming of the U.S. Capitol back on January the 6th, although that might be the stated purpose for these uh, gun control measures. Uh, they've been going after these gun bans on Capitol grounds, state Capitol grounds included, uh, for months now. And the motive is simple. They don't want to be around gun owners. They want to have a gun-free zone around them, lawmakers, uh, as much and as often as possible. That's not the way a right works. And uh, I hope, well, I'm not confident at all, I hope that the uh, lawmakers in Washington State, uh, in the state of Virginia, in Michigan, and these other locations that are considering capital gun bans, I really hope they think about whether or not their cure is worse than the disease that they are purporting to solve here. Meanwhile, we do have a couple of other states that are moving in the uh, opposite direction. Uh, in Montana, uh, the uh, provisions of constitutional carry legislation just signed by Governor Greg Gianforte include the ability to carry inside the state capitol. Uh, same in Utah, where a constitutional carry just signed by Governor Spencer Cox. Really, there are only a handful of states out there that completely bar the lawful carrying of firearms in state capitals. And while I am sad that we have some states where those rules exist, I, I, I really uh, I think it's a, a bad move to start expanding the list of those states. When you look at the right to carry revolution that we've seen around this country over the past 30 years or so, now yeah, closer to 40 now, 35, we'll, we'll split the difference. We've seen that move in one direction. From one constitutional carry state, Vermont, to 18 constitutional carry states, from uh, about uh, 20 or so shall issue states to now 42 shall issue states, uh, and a reduction of discretionary issue or may issue concealed carry states down to just eight. And again, going back to our first topic today, Supreme Court has a chance to weigh in on the right to carry in the uh, very near future, uh, and I hope that they do so. And in doing so, send a message to uh, anti-gun politicians and anti-gun activists the right to bear arms is just as real and just as fundamental as the right to keep them. Speaking of, let's uh, turn our attention to our good deed of the day, our recidivist report, our uh, armed citizen story. We'll start with our uh, recidivist report. Case out of Gallatin, Tennessee, where police say they have arrested a serial burglar uh, well known to law enforcement. In fact, uh, Kendall Link has been known to law enforcement ever since he's reached the age of adulthood. Uh, police say that um, he has a history of vehicle burglaries and thefts. He's been arrested again after he went on another crime spree last month. Uh, Kendall Link is accused of seeing, stealing a uh, car stereo in the uh, case that actually led to him being arrested. But they say that he then went on to steal a vehicle that had been parked outside of a uh, residence. He then burglarized an unlocked vehicle less than a week later. Uh, Lieutenant Jamar Ballard, excuse me, Lieutenant Lamar Ballard with the uh, Gallatin, Tennessee Police Department, said uh, Mr. Link for years has been going into cars and actually removing electronics, removing car parts, anything. Uh, just because it's attached to the car doesn't mean that he's not going to steal it. According to Ballard, the uh, 37-year-old suspect has a lengthy criminal history dating back to 2001. Uh, he was most recently arrested and charged with burglaring six vehicles uh, in a uh, subdivision back in late August of 2020. His newest charges include one count of auto burglary, four counts of theft of property, scheduled to appear in court on May the 5th. But then, of course, he'll be able to bond out of jail. And who knows how many other charges he might rack up uh, in the uh, near term. But it sounds like despite this 20-year criminal history, the 37-year-old has never really suffered any consequences 
for the uh, myriad number of crimes that uh, he has committed and is alleged to have committed over the past few decades. Maybe, maybe this time will be uh, the difference maker. Uh, Our armed citizen story from uh, Philadelphia today, where a woman uh, shot an intruder in the Kensington neighborhood. This happened, uh, I believe it was uh, Sunday morning, just before 3 a.m. Police say a suspect entered a home where two women were inside, was not invited, was not welcomed into the home. Uh, One of the women told officers that's where she uh, shot the man once in the thigh. The 32-year-old suspect taken to uh, Temple University Hospital. Last check was listed in critical condition. And uh, one person that spoke with uh, CBS in Philadelphia said if it was his family, he would have done the same thing. Robert Gonzalez said, quote, because if he's getting into my house, I probably would have done the same thing if I had a gun. I'm just going to do things a lot safer, look out for myself, make sure whoever comes got a look, look at his face, see what's going on, you know, probably scope him. Uh, Police say that the uh, gun uh, used by the woman was legally owned by her. No charges have been filed against the woman. No charges expected to be filed against the woman. And again, in Philadelphia, you know, we've seen a number of armed citizens acting in self-defense over the past couple of weeks, both against carjackings and against home invasions. The problem in Philly is is that the city doesn't want these armed citizens acting in self-defense. They keep putting up barriers between you and your right to keep and bear arms, going so far as to shut down the Philadelphia Police Department's gun permit unit for a period of time last year. And right now, there is a more than year-long wait for individuals to simply apply for their concealed carry license if they want to bear arms outside of the home in self-defense at a time in which homicides and violent crime in Philadelphia near an all-time high. Uh, Finally today, our good deed of the day from uh, the great state of Georgia, where a police officer at uh, Gwinnett College able to uh, save the life of a a grandmother who had uh, collapsed from uh, cardiac arrest That officer, Ashley Still, was uh, working out at a YMCA in uh, Winder, Georgia. She said one of the employees ran over to me and said there's a lady who collapsed. So she said I followed her over. When I saw that the lady was on the ground, she displayed the classic signs of cardiac arrest. She wasn't conscious. She wasn't alert. She wasn't breathing, displaying agonal gasps, which is not normal breathing. Uh, So along with YMCA staff and a a fellow off-duty officer who was there working out, still performed CPR, used an automatic uh, external defibrillator, she said, uh, went straight into CPR. The YMCA staff was fantastic. They had already started the emergency alert system. They are already hooking her up to the AED. It worked flawlessly for us. Uh, and uh, they were able to get her heart restarted, which is amazing. The woman's daughter and a twin 20-month-old grandsons paid Sergeant still a visit at work not long ago to say thank you. She said, quote, hopefully this continues a friendship outside of this. But to know that her mom's doing great is awesome. Just seeing that joy... I get it. I lost my dad to a cardiac-related event. So I know the devastation. And to see the joy on the other end makes it worth it. She says she is uh, staying in touch with the family, even provided a walker donated by a friend of hers uh, for the woman to use when she is discharged from the hospital. So in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Sergeant Ashley Still, there in uh, Gwinnett County, Georgia, we thank you very much for your very good deed. That is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program as well. Don't forget, you can subscribe to Bearing Arms Cam and Company. That way you will never miss a program. You can do that on YouTube, by the way. I should probably tell you where you can subscribe to Town Hall Media. Wait, I think I got confused. See, it gets confusing. On Town Hall Media, no. On YouTube, you want to subscribe to Town Hall Media. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. On Rumble.com, you want to subscribe to Bearing Arms Cam and Company. <sighs> Just look up Cam and Company. You'll find it on YouTube, on Rumble, on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Townhall.com's podcast page, Bearing Arms Cam and Company. Look for that. You should be good to go. We'll be back tomorrow with more of the latest Second Amendment news and information from all across the nation. But until then, be well, be safe, and be free.